Hello and welcome back and today we're doing another review of a PCIe Gen 4 SSD. Now you may have noticed on the channel there's been an absolute deluge of PCIe Gen 4 M2 NVMe SSDs and that is largely because of about 15 or 20 different factors which have largely knackered the SSD industry in the last 18 months. The US-China trade war, the uh, pandemic, let's be honest, that's a biggie, Chia, um, hardware shortages, droughts over in Taiwan, its effect on the semiconductor industry, changes in buying and business patterns, and the availability of SSDs worldwide have led to an absolute muckery going round with release schedules on SSDs from a number of brands. And a lot of SSDs that should have been released at the end of 2020 didn't. They simply didn't. And what happened was, rather than lots and lots of PCIe Gen 4x4 SSDs entering the market, all with over 7,000 megabytes per second, all at once arriving on the scene in a lovely little period there at the end of the year, only a few of them arrived. Your Samsung 980 Pros, your WD Blacks, your Sabrent Rockets, that sort of thing. But the bulk of them didn't. And because of those delays and everyone catching up at the pandemic and people slowly easing their way out of this situation... The result has been that loads and loads of SSDs that are actually remarkably similar that in their own right would have stood out fundamentally and massively are all being released so close together, your Fire Cudas, your MP600s, your MSI Spatiums and more, all seem to be arriving at the same time and hence why there's loads of reviews. However, today's review is a little different. This is the Rocket Q4, if the light isn't going to completely mess this up for you guys watching. Now... What makes this one different is this is arriving alongside a lot of other um, PCIe Gen 4 SSDs. It actually arrived quite a while ago, earlier in 2021. But this one is taking advantage of much more affordable NAND, known as QLC. QLC, quad layer cells, is somewhat frowned upon by lots of SSD purists out there. Because this SSD... And that kind of NAND, although it prioritizes capacity over performance by allowing much larger amounts of data per NAND cell on board, thereby having a better price point, has an effect on its durability long term and how long it will last, you know, as data is written to it consistently and electricity is passed through it, but also the performance and the retrieval of that data is suitably lower as well. Now, a lot of people run systems that they're not going to be able to hit the massive 7,000 performance from the likes of their own Rocket 4 Plus series, while well, I'm wrecking the joint over there, and such as their own Rocket 4 Plus here, which has 7,000 megabytes per second and well over 6,000 megabytes per second right. This SD, on the other hand, at peak in its largest capacity, hits 4,900 megabytes per second read and 3,500 megabytes per second write, by no means saturating the PCIe Gen 4x4 bandwidth potential of 8,000 megs. So this SSD, for a lot of people, is either going to be a bit of a disappointment when they look at the specs, or they're going to be people thinking, well, my system was never going to hit that peak anyway, why spend so much more? Because that's the key point here. The Rocket Q4 arrives at actually quite an affordable price. When we look at each of the tiers arriving at 1TB, 2TB and 4TB at $150, $310 and $730 respectively, they sound like a lot of money. But when you look at those same capacities from all the other brands, and particularly their own peak premium series, you notice that at that top end, this 4TB here, retail when the light isn't going nuts, uh, this 4TB knocking around for about $700 is almost three to $400 less than this one. And they're both four terabytes. They're both PCIe Gen 4x4 SSDs. They're both using Fizon controllers, and they're both using 96-layer NAND. So, ultimately, for very similar architecture SSDs, what does that price difference make? Is that speed performance they're giving, are they playing it safe, or are they overplaying it? The comedian Dave Gordon, to paraphrase him, um, Dave Gorman once said of flights going to Europe, 
If you're taking a plane to Europe and you're going to Germany, for example, or Spain, let's say Spain, lovely place, lovely weather. You're going to Spain, you look at the flight and you look at the return ticket and the return ticket is £700. And you go, right, well, that plane better serve me champagne and caviar. I want to be picked up at my house. I want to wake up in another country. I want to make it nice and easy. If I'm paying extra, I want premium. At the other hand, if you were going to go to Spain and the ticket price was one dollar each way your brain is understandably thinking that plane's not leaving the ground nice and simple now this isn't no one dollar plane fight flight however it is remarkably cheap for a pcie gen 4 times 4 ssd so today's video isn't just about benchmarking this drive this video is about figuring out is this a one dollar flight to spain or does it actually provide value? Can it live up to the benchmarks they are saying? Are they overestimating? Are they playing it safe? Or are they just playing it straight down the line with the truth? We have tested this drive on PS5 as well. And even though that software beta um, is still not completely out of beta and for everyone, it did get recognized by the system and it did allow us to load and play games from it within the PS5 beta. So again, it does work in that system, so at least we're getting somewhere. Now, in terms of the internal specifications, as mentioned, there's the three capacities at 1, 2, and 4 TB. There's also an optional heat sink, and again, much like the other heat sink that we've seen previously here on the channel, I will say, this is a pretty heat sink. I really like the rose gold and silver design. We will be utilizing this heat sink in our testing with the drive going inside there with the thermal heat pads already i've already preloaded two of the screws in there to keep it together but it arrives with those pads thermal pads already pre-applied and it's a lovely chunky heat sink there and i actually prefer the color as well um yes that's an optional purchase one of the things i'm less keen on again with sabrent um, this is kind of a critique for their entire range. Actually, it's an incredibly small critique at that, but it's done, it is something that annoys me, one of two gripes I have, is that if you're going to buy an SSD with a heatsink, and again, if you look at the model ID, this heatsink model here actually does arrive as a package. You know, this is both the SSD and the heatsink, but the SSD is not inside. It arrives separate in a separate retail box there. And I don't quite like that. I think if I'm buying an SSD with a heatsink, I would like it applied at the factory level where dust control, air control, and strategically placed thermal padding is something I expect from a first party heatsink that's purchased with the SSD together and I'm paying extra for that. Um, the other thing I'm less keen on is their warranty procedure. I think it's quite well documented online. Um, their SSDs do arrive with a five-year warranty, which, again, all SSDs should in 2021. It's mad and they shouldn't. But you have to register for that warranty. And if you don't register for the warranty, you only get one year, which to me is really weird. I don't want to have to go out of my way to get a warranty when just by purchasing the thing, I should have my five-year warranty. So, again, not something I'm a fan of about Sabrent's architecture there. But in every other regard, as a brand and as their product products, I've got no real other complaints of them as a brand. They have availability, their warranty process from what I can see is very, very straightforward once you need a warranty. And the architecture of these drives is comparable to Gigabyte, to MSI's drive, to a lot and lot of Fison based SSDs at the moment. Now, we have a look inside, we get that lovely little case we talked about before. We have a look inside, have a look at the SSD, and much like the Rocket um, 4 Plus, it has that metal panel there at the top. This is a double-sided SSD, and this is the 4TB model, but because it's using QLC NAND, it's not massively filled across the whole drive. There's actually a little bit of space there on the back, which does lead the question, if they would ever release an 8TB model of this, because QLC NAND does allow for up to 8 terabytes on a 2280 length SSD. Although, one would argue the price tag of that SSD would be fairly astronomical. You're talking probably $1,500 to $1,600 at least, and uh, not a lot of people are going to pay for that. They're just simply not going to pay. So if they were to go down that road with an 8TB, I can't imagine the uptake would be massive. 
Now, the controller inside is the Fison E16, so not the E18. They've scaled it back to the earlier revision, which again makes sense if you're using that NAND because you're not going to hit the peaks of that, what, the 7,000 megabytes per second plus that the Fison E18 controller is capable of. I've mentioned about the NAND. It is QLC NAND, but on top of that, it is a um, 96 layer micron um, QLC NAND there. So the result is that you do have a decent amount of um, you know uh, quantity and quality of that NAND comparable to a lot of other PCIe Gen 4 SSDs in the market in terms of architecture, but just bear in mind QLC NAND means lower endurance, lower performance, better price per capacity. Now it's using NVMe 1.3 revision, not 1.4, but again, given the E16 controller, this is understandable and not something it's really going to be able to grow out of anyway. Um, of the capacities, obviously the performance scales as you go from the one to the two to the four. Uh, 4,700 megabytes per second over 1,850 megabytes per second, read, write respectively, uh, the one TB. And then going up to 4,800 over 3,600. And then this one has a promised 4,900 over 3,500. So yes, we're going to be keeping a very close eye on that when we do our Atto and when we do our um, um, disk benchmarking on this very shortly. Now, in terms of IOPS, unsurprisingly, it's fairly low, not only because of the QLC NAND inside, but also just generally the E16 controller not being able to match the heights of the E18 controller, and it's in some places um, 1 million IOPS there. This at the lowest end is 180,000 over 450,000. Again, read, write respectively, going into 350 and 700,000. And then at the top again, 350 over 700,000. That's the peak of this, which is still good. But again, slide of, a lot of people aren't really going to be relying on this for the high end quick response times. I think a lot of the time they're going to be far more focused on sequential data, big data for affordability of QLC NAND. Now, I mentioned the warranty at um, five slash one years. But the other thing that's worth bearing in mind, of course, is durability. Now, QLC NAND, that's one of the main things people look down on. And the durability of this isn't fantastic. It's 0.1 drive rights per day. That means for every terabyte, you're talking 100 gig. You can't write more than 100 gig per day. And again, you are dealing with a drive at large capacity. So if you have a lot of refresh of data you're going to burn through um the tb uh, the terabytes written and the drive rights per day it, um pretty quickly on a drive like this and potentially exceed that five-year warranty in terms of your coverage long term once it's clocked up there on the controller so do bear that in mind if you're thinking archival and just long-term storage you'll be better off if you can have a good recycle of data rate this may not be the drive for you now bear in mind once you compare that against the rocket plus the rocket plus knocking in at 0.38 drive rights per day, uh, even at the 4 TB limit. That's a large difference there to bear in mind. And again, that's why this drive should be a chief focus for you in terms of capacity, not performance, not endurance, not refresh of data. Now, I'm going to flick over now to the test machine where we're going to run all of our barrage of tests. As mentioned, we're taking advantage, of, as in previous videos, with a 6-core 11th gen um, i5 processor and 16 gig of DDR4 memory with this drive being utilized as a secondary drive. The OS drive is a SATA SSD, doesn't create any bottleneck in the test that we perform and we'll be utilizing AS SSD, Atto Disk Benchmark, Crystal Disk Benchmark and 8JA all the way through our testing. We're going to leave one minute gap between every test for the SSD to cool down. We don't give it too much because we want to keep it realistic, but enough that we can be fair and we are going to be utilizing this heatsink. Let's make our way to the test bench. Okay, so we're on the desktop of my test machine and there is the Sabrent Rocket Q4 4TB model that we're going to be running through tests with today. Right, so 
There is our machine, as mentioned, it's the 11th Gen i5 6 core processor there, and 16 gig of memory. It's got embedded graphics, no graphics card inside, so that will kind of knock a little bit off the test there. We're also utilizing OBS, a reason which I'm gonna explain in just a moment. And in this Windows 10 environment, we've already mounted the drive, and it's available here. We've loaded it as a separate drive, and it's not the OS drive. We've also got a connected USB drive, but just remember that it's the S drive that we're focusing on today which is the Sabrent rocket we've got it in its own first party heatsink but we will be keeping an eye on the temperature because apparently this drive can run quite hot so we will be monitoring this throughout now today's video will be utilizing several tests it will be taking advantage of the crystal disk software sorry if it went black there it's just because when we're running this we are uh, having to get the Windows authentication every time as an admin user so it will go black every time we open those up and again utilizing the s drive very very important also alongside this and we'll be running three different test files there we'll also be looking at atto disk benchmark and in atto disk benchmark again using the sabrent we'll be running three different file sizes on that one we'll also be using ASSSD there on screen and in ASSSD we will be running again a one a three and a five gigabyte test file and finally we will be taking advantage of AJA um, video disk benchmark and again that will be a one a four and a 16 gigabyte test file all of them on that Sabrent Rocket 4 Plus Q uh, Rocket uh, Q4 SSD and three tests on AJA however it has to be stated that I'm not going to be able to show much of the test being performed I'm going to go through all of the tests later on but notwithstanding the fact that each test takes around two minutes and every test we're going to leave a one minute cool down gap for the system we're going to give it one minute between each tests notwithstanding that that's going to take a good 20 to 25 minutes also having obs running internally will affect the read write performance so just to give you an idea if i read and start on this now we can see that this is only hitting around two and a half thousand when this ssd should be able to do nearly double that and that largely is because of obs so in order to uh, remove that as any kind of throttling or bottleneck, I'm gonna perform the test and then reactivate OBS so we can go through the results together. So all of these tests should be available in a link in the description over to NAS Compares if it's already published. If not, it's with you very shortly. And all of these tests are gonna be conducted in one session without any system reboot. So what I'm gonna do now is close OBS and then I'm going to make my way through all our barrage of testing and go through the results with you shortly. For you it'll be seconds but for me it's going to be a good 25-30 minutes away. Let's begin the tests. Right so our testing has completed and I'll be honest for the most part I'm quite impressed. There's some things that I'm a little surprised by but for the most part it's a pretty good SSD and it lives up to its promises. As you can see, we've conducted all of our tests. You can see all the host reads and writes and stuff like that and how long the drives have been on. But what's particularly interesting is the temperature. Now, for the most part, as I say, this is going to be good news. But I'm just going to like start with something I was a little put off by. And it's the temperature. Now, this drive hit into the 50s so quickly it was unreal now yes this is performance testing and we are bombarding these drives quite heavily so what we are doing in all of these tests through aja to assd to atto to aj all of these different softwares we're not using typical usage so this isn't indicative of general day-to-day -day use but it has to be said that this drive leapt into the 50s very quickly throughout its utilization, throughout all of the testing that just took place. And even now, we've stopped accessing this drive for quite a while, and it's still sitting at 42 quite easily. So the, the heat is very much in this SSD. But I wanted to highlight the SSD temperature on this, largely because in almost every other regard, not only does this SSD live up to the promises that they make on their own website, but it exceeds it in a number of areas. Once again, just to remind you, they had a reported maximum on this drive of 4,000, where is it? I've just lost it. Um, 4,900 megabytes per second read sequential and 3,500 megabytes per second uh, sequential write. So read and write there. So bearing that in mind, 
The first test we can go straight into is one of the most easy to read, and of course that's Crystal Disk. And on the Crystal Disk benchmark, given this was 4,900 over 3,500, it exceeded it in every single occasion. The one, the four, and the 16 gigabyte test file. A 4,900 there, and again going as high as 4,989, and in right, 3,900. So again, exceeding the right by over 50 megabytes per second and 80 in many cases, and exceeding the reported sequential right there of almost 500 megabytes, around around 400 and um, uh, 4,069 there. So a huge uptick there on sequential. In terms of everything else, it's all fairly standard and uh, moderately predictable. But again, they weren't harboring anything there. And my analogy about plane flights and the cost of planes and everything today pioneering together to make this one of the most awkwardly noise editing videos I've ever made. Bloody seagulls. Um, I've got to say that those are some great performance benchmarks there from Crystal Disk. Now, moving away from Crystal Disk, let's go into Atto. Again, an oldie but a goodie. Make our way into it. And again, 256 uh, megabytes, so a quarter of a gig, one gig, and four gig. We can have a look there, and we can see on uh, in terms of the overall uh, performance there, going straight away from IOPS, we can see there, again, in write speed there, Remember, they reported 3.5 gigabytes, and again, going into 3.6, doing very well consistently there on right. And in terms of read, again, cracking into the 5 gigabytes very easily, again, exceeding their own reported uh, performance there in pretty much everything from 2.56 to 1 gig to 4 gig very comfortably there. Yes, the drive ran hot, there's no denying it, but at the same time, it maxed out those numbers comfortably. Of course, looking at IOPS is a bit tough because the reported IOPS on this drive of 350,000 over 700,000, of course, applies to 4K files and we're not going that low. But even these figures here for a quarter of a gig, one gig and four gig, although immaterial in this context, are still very good indeed. So coming out of there, we can go into AS um, SSD benchmark go into that there and again once again some lovely figures as always a little bit more real world a little bit more worthy and the figures are always sub what the other tests say because it's a little bit more aggressive uh, a little more stringent but again lovely figures there balancing out what we've seen previously within the context of as ssd at one three and five gigabytes and again that translates just as well when we move into iops for each of these tests of course so again, lovely stuff there. All have to be read within the context of QLC NAND. We're not comparing this up against some mighty highfalutin drive indeed. If we go into some of the rocket testing, this here are the results for the rocket NVMe. So this isn't even the plus. This is the next tier up from this drive, but not the highest tier. And if we look at the AS benchmarks on these and compare them side by side, we can see that it's still measuring up quite well if we go on this drive here and we go into the megabytes per second and compare them there it's not that far behind the 3d tlc nand drive there overall and the same applies to if you look at some of the other measurements taken in the likes of um uh, this crystal disc here wherever on crystal disc if we go into the 16 gig file there and compare it against the 16 gig test file on this drive so that's the bottom one get rid of that pop that down there we can see that the difference even though the one on the right is a more expensive drive the um, 16 gig test of the qlc nand drive here the q4 is still pretty close indeed through a number of those tests so again full respect to it there now coming out of as and crystal disc there Let's go into um, our test here using AJA. Now, once again, AJA, ignore the top numbers, immaterial. We need to look at the bottom, the graph there, to see where it maxed out. So first and foremost, you can see there on uh, disk writes and disk read. Do bear in mind, you have to flip those when it comes to um, AJA. So disk writes and AJA is actually a read activity on the disk. And we can see in read, it was hitting uh, around about uh, 4,002, 4,003. And indeed, on the larger file at 4 gig, 
it was getting more like 4,001, 4,002 there. And again, going on to the other side, getting quite close to 4,000 on both tests. And of course, we go to the larger file there, we can see a little bit more bouncy with the larger test file, a little bit more of a sustained performance there. Not quite as smooth, but still a bigger file. But again, those numbers still measure up quite similar to what we've seen previously. Overall, I'm impressed by this drive. I came into this review quite sceptical, if I'm honest. Not because of Sabrent, because I've tested a number of Sabrent's drives, and generally, I've always been quite impressed by them, both for the affordability and how early they brought their drives to market for a brand that up until like a year and a half ago, I only know, knew them as enclosure salesmen. I'm pretty impressed by what I've seen here and the other Rocket reviews. And for what you're paying on this drive, it doesn't hold any punches back, and I think the performance does live up to all of the promises they make. Am I hugely impressed by it? I think it's the ultimate drive. No, I don't. I think the Rocket Plus is still the best one, the Rocket 4 Plus, and this drive does seem to run particularly hot. And alongside that, the drive rights per day, the endurance of this drive, because of that QLC NAND, is pretty weak. And of course, that issue of one versus five year warranty without registration, still not a fan of that. But these are small things in the grand scheme of things on a drive that I think does deliver. And if you are using a system that isn't absolutely aggressive as hell and you're looking for a PCIe 4 system, maybe uh, for mid-level editing, an SMB user, a home editor or for streaming, and you're not going to be really, really aggressively tackling that drive and you don't see, you're not going to see the 7,000 megabytes per second of the more expensive drives, this does serve as a very great alternative. Just do bear in mind that endurance, that drive rights per day, to register your warranty and to know that you are still dealing with quad layer cell NAND. Thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed this video, click like, because I do a lot of reviews and it helps me understand what you guys like in these. If you want to learn more about SSD reviews, we've got even more of this newer generation of SSDs being reviewed in the coming weeks so subscribe to stay tuned for that and of course take advantage of the links in the description the top one takes you to nas compares free advice section where me and eddie the web guy give completely free impartial advice to people that need assistance with their data storage strategy home and business completely and utterly free we do nothing with your email also there's links there to other ssds i've mentioned as well as other resources to make sure you get the right ssd first time thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time.